Well, we're at the beginning of the year, and uh, that is normally a time for me uh, that I love to spend planning. So I'm a full-on planner. It just uh, makes me breathe a little bit easier, gives me confidence to kind of go into the new year if I have like a plan, like for everything <laughs> in my life, like from home, from training to church and sermon series and, and everything, plans. I just love, I feel better, happy if I have a plan. Now it seems from the passage that Candace just read to you, the passage that we're going to look at this morning, it seems that uh, planning, according to James, inspired by the Spirit, uh, according to God, it seems like planning may be useless at best or perhaps even evil, right? So James says, uh, you, you talk about in this next year, we're going to go to a certain place and do this and that and make money. And he says, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. It's like you're planning your year. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow, i.e. useless. And then he goes on to call that arrogance and boasting and uses the word evil. So what does that mean for people like me and perhaps just a few of you, the other two out there uh, who love to plan? What does that mean? And I want to have a look at that this morning. And so let me just give you the summary of this passage, like right up front. So that, hey, if you like need to go somewhere, you just got the summary, you can just like stop the broadcast and, you know, carry on with your Sunday. Don't do that. Lots of exciting things still coming up. But here's the summary. Here's what this passage means. The fact that we make plans is not God's concern. Imagining that we are in control is the problem. The problem is not that we make plans, luckily for me. The problem is the assumption that we are in control. Because it should be very clear to the Christian that we are not in control. Or should I say, it should be very clear, especially to the Christian, that we're not in control. Because to anybody listening, if you have not yet realized that we're not in control, then you must have been living on Mars during 2020. That's at least one thing that we learned over this past year, that we are absolutely powerless over things that have the ability to compete completely disrupt and in some cases devastate our lives. We've been forced to confront the illusion of control. And so this passage from James, this little block of instruction, just seems so much more relevant to me now. I mean, I've thought about this passage often, I've taught through James, but somehow this year, the beginning of the year, as we think about the year and make our plans, this seems a lot more relevant. For example, when it says, don't say we're going to go to this city this next year. Last year was the first time that I was not able uh, to make good on my promise to Kristen and her family that they would see each other in the course of a year. So our travel plans were disrupted, as I'm sure a lot of your travel plans and other plans were completely disrupted last year. So James points out our presumptuousness. He confronts us with our presumptuousness on two levels in this passage. Kind of a macro level, how presumptuous we are, and then also on a micro level. So let's look at that macro level first. So the first assumption that we make, sometimes especially in the beginning of the year, is the assumption that we're just going to keep on living somehow. That come this time, next year, we will have done all that we had planned through the course of the year. That we're just going to be alive from day to day. James kind of confronts us with that presumptuousness. It says in verse 15, so instead what you should say is, if the Lord wills, we'll live. It's the first part is, if the Lord wills, I'll, I'll be alive. And then to make the point, he uses that very tangible metaphor. He says, what is your life? And then he says, well, here's what your life is. 
It's a mist, a fog, a vapor. It's a very rich metaphor just saying, hey, how fragile and transitory life actually is. You know, like you wake up in the morning, beautiful morning, like it was this morning, and there's maybe a bit of mist and fog around, and then the sun comes up and just, poof, it's just gone. That's exactly the picture that James has in mind that he's confronting us with about our lives. We're around, we're there, and it's good, and then just vanishes, forgotten. It's a perilous presumption that we're just going to be around. And again, as difficult as this is, last year we were confronted, not just with the illusion of control, but we were confronted with our fragility. Now this revelation on its own, it should change the way we live. It's kind of like that old like cliche, if you knew that you were you know, going to die tomorrow, like, how would you live your life today? That's kind of the idea that's in mind here. So if you knew this was your last year, last month, last week, what plans would you make then? Make your plans now with this illusion of being invincible. Your life is a mist and a vapor. So how would you plan your life? It's going to change our priorities, I think, and change our plans. So what plans would you make if you, if we were really confronted with the fragility and how just transitory life is? So that's the one assumption, the assumption of life. It's a macro level assumption. Here's the second assumption that James points out on a much smaller scale. See, I think Christians are mostly aware, those of you out there, I think we're mostly aware of our fragility and how God is in control of our very existence. We forget that often, especially in our planning, but mostly we know that. Now, on this level, this microscopic level, this is something we rarely think about, or maybe it's just me. So the first assumption is the assumption of life. The second assumption is the assumption of livelihood. Or, to really get into the microscopic level of this, the assumption that we are in control of the outcomes of our activities. We're in control of the outcomes of our plans. Did you pick that up in the passage? It's there in the detail. See, in verse 13, it's, it's not just those who say, come, we'll live there for a year. It's not just the assumption of being alive. It also says, come, we'll live there and trade and make a profit. In other words, the assumption that our inputs will equal the desired outputs. We're just completely in control. You make your plans, you go about your business, you do your day-to-day, and the results will take care of themselves. We are in control of the outcomes of our plans. We'll just make a profit. It just, it just will happen. Now, in this time that, that James is writing here was actually a time of great economic prosperity in the Greek cities of Palestine. So this really was an assumption. God was like, we're just going to go there, hang out for a while. We've got this business plan and man, we're just going to make it. We'll just make, we'll just do it. We'll just make a profit. And James is challenging this assumption that our plans and our day-to-day activities will have the exact outcomes that we hope that they will have. Notice again in verse 15. Again, it says, don't say this, we're going to live here and trade and make a profit. Instead, say this, if God wills, I'll be alive. Macroscopic assumption. If God wills, I'll be alive. But then it says this, and if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. Did you pick that up? Verse 15. If the Lord wills, I'll do this and that. Like I'll actually have the ability to carry out the detail of these plans. In other words, it's acknowledging the will of God over our lives, over our doings, this and that, our comings and goings, our ins and outs, and over the outcomes of those doings, this and that, the trading and actually the ability to make a profit. This is something I think we as Christians forget all the time. 
that the outcomes, that we just put these incomes, these inputs, and here comes these outputs, outputs everything that we had hoped and planned was just going to happen. Especially when it comes to this idea, again, of our livelihood, our income. We were confronted with that last year, weren't we? Just last week, I read this scripture to you from Deuteronomy 8. It says, Beware, lest you say in your heart, My power, the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the power to get wealth. He's, he's over it. He's over that equation. He's over the outputs of all of the activities of our lives. James is confronting us with this. The perilous presumption that things will work out the way we expect, the way we planned. Bottom line, this passage is a passage about the peril of presumption. We faced it. We saw that peril last year. The peril of presumption. But then, James kind of upgrades the language a little bit. The peril of presumption, he actually calls it the arrogance of this presumptuousness. In fact, calls it the evil, the evil evil of these assumptions that we make most often as we're heading to the beginning of a year. And I want to dig into that. Why does James use this heavy language? We don't use the language evil and simple lightly. So let's dig into this a little bit. Is he just being dramatic, like trying to make a point using this heavy language? Well, I don't think so. He means to use this idea of sinfulness and evil in this context. So let's talk about that for a little bit. Let me ask you this. Is it possible for a Christian to live like an atheist? Is it possible for a Christian to live like a non-Christian? And you go, well, yes, of course. I mean, we see it all the time. I see it in my life a lot of the time. When you look at our character, the way we live is not different often to people that don't believe in Christ Our ethical standards are often not very different to the ethics of the world around us. So we go, yes, Christians live like atheists all the time. Well, what James is pointing out, that beyond those obvious ways that we live like atheists, he's pointing out another way that Christians, in the way they go about their lives, actually live like atheists. And it's not that obvious. It's in these assumptions. It's this picture he's creating here of a person. He's talking to Christians. It's interesting because when he says, come now, or listen now, I think in the translation Candace said, it's like, it's like very colloquial. It's a language used of like, no, he's addressing people outside the church. But no, the letter is written to people in the church. And what he's saying is like he's talking to Christians here, but it doesn't look like it. The picture he's creating is of a person who's a born-again, committed follower of Jesus, going about their day-to-day lives without any, any regard for the personal, intimate involvement that God has in their lives. Just going about their business this year, we're going to do this and that, we're going to trade and make a profit. He's talking to Christians who live their lives without the slightest regard for God's intimate, personal involvement in their lives and their livelihood. You see, a Christian, I think we all know this, a Christian is somebody who lives with a humble dependence, a humble dependence and trust in the sovereignty of God over their whole lives, yes, but also the detail. Also the detail of their lives. They know God is personally, intimately involved in the doing this and that, in the livelihood, in the life. And so they are people who will say things like, 
Well, if the Lord wills, I will live. And if the Lord wills, I will do this and that. And if the Lord wills, I will trade and make a profit. A Christian is somebody who uses these words. He lives like this. Now, let me say this. this. That's not a formula. That's not something you just attach on. If God wills it, and that just makes you spiritual. I remember coming across this not too long ago where uh, one of my mentors uh, he always SM, you know, messaged me and we'd make plans to get together and go, all right, I'll see you tomorrow. Uh, and then at the end of the message, we'd have this brackets DV. I remember going like that, but his initials aren't DV. What is this DV about? And so like, I Googled, Googled it. What, is, what does DV stand for? And found out it stands for Deo Volente. Does that help? Right. Deo Volente, which literally means if God wills. And so he would sign these messages with this statement of if God wills. And so if you want to be super Christian, just pop that into all your WhatsApp messages. At any of every message, put bracket, DV. Guys will be confused and they'll look it up and they'll see God wills and you'll just seem super spiritual. No, no, no. You see, that's, not, that's not the point here. It's simply adding on this vocabulary, including it into our language. That's not the point. The point James is making of somebody who lives with a very different worldview who's cognizant, who's aware, constantly aware of life under the will of God. Life lived under the will of God. That's what he means. If God wills, I'll live. If the Lord wills, I'll do this or that. You don't have to insert it into every sentence. The point is to live where there's evidence that we as Christians live our lives knowing God is personally intimately involved in the detail of our lives and our whole lives as a whole. So this is a huge subject on its own, the will of God. I mean, it's massive. And I don't have time to get into it in detail this morning, but I need to outline a few parts of it because James is talking about that a little bit here. So when we talk about the will of God, whenever that comes up in the Bible, it's used in one of three ways the will of God. Firstly, we talk about God's will of decree. Secondly, if you're taking notes, we're talking about God's will of desire. And thirdly, God's will of direction. God's will of decree, His will of desire, His will of direction. So God's will of decree is this idea that the reality that we live under, that God is in control. So if God determines something to happen, well, it happens. And when something happens, it's because God determined that it would happen. God's will of decree, His sovereignty, He is over pandemic, He's over our lives. That's what we mean by God's will of decree. And that's mainly what James is talking about here. Hey, remember, God is the one in control. He's over everything. That's God's will of decree. Secondly, God's will of desire. Well, that's a little different. It's like what God wills for me. Like, what does he want for me? It's a good question. It's a great question. <laughs> what does God want for me this year? Man, we could spend a lot of time there. But actually, it's pretty simple. God's desire for us is that we grow in holiness, in that we draw closer in personal relationship with him, and that we use the gifts and abilities he's given us for the expansion of our kingdom. There you go. God's will of desire. Just write that down. You're done. I mean, seriously, the Bible uses this language, for example, 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 3 says, For this is the will of God. If you read that, you're like, oh my word, the will of God, finally. And it says, your sanctification, your holiness. That's God's will of desire. That's what He wants for you. It's different to His will of decree. What He determines happens, everything that happens is because God determined it. So God's will of decree, God's will of desire. And then number three, God's will of direction. And that's another aspect of the will of God that's featured in this passage. It's why I need to draw these out just a little bit for you. It's the massive area of our lives where, especially in the beginning of the year, where we're often praying and inquiring of God. We'll use, the Bible uses that language, inquiring of the Lord. What should I do in this instance? So it's not an ethical decision. There's no biblical answers. Like, God, shall I stay married to my spouse? There's yes, just yes. But I'm talking about non-ethical questions. Like, shall I take this job? Is this the person I should marry? 
you won't find an answer to the Bible, answer to that question in the Bible. But as Christians, we want to know what God's will of direction is. Hey, God, are you leading me this way? Or are you leading me that way? Now, that's another huge subject on its own. But never fear. Very first sermon series coming up. We're going to have a look at that. But it's, James is talking about that here in that very last verse, verse 17, which seems strange. When you read the passage, it's like, where did that come from? Let me read it again, verse 17. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So this is James now bringing up, so God's will of decree. If God wills, I will live. If God wills, I'll do this and that. If God wills, the output will be what I hope the input would result in. God's will of decree, but now is God's will of direction, where Christians do this. Christians don't just acknowledge that their plans are under the sovereign will of God's decree. Christians constantly interrogate their plans, asking, is this God's will of direction for our lives? That's how we live. We use this kind of language. So I love this example I came across. Um, Bob Pierce, the founder of World Vision, great humanitarian uh, agency dealing with alleviating uh, world poverty. Uh, kind of near the end of his life, he was asked, like, what accounted for the impact that he had made? And he said this. He said, early on, he learned to pray a very simple prayer. And this is his prayer. Lord, I give you the right to change my agenda at any time you like, without informing me in advance. Right? That, that's, that's language we use. That's the language of a Christian, acknowledging God's will of decree, but also God's will of direction. So, church family, listen up. When we forget God's will of decree, we live like atheists, ignoring His sovereign will over our lives, arrogantly assuming we're in control. When we forget God's will of decree, we end up living like atheists, arrogantly ignoring God's sovereign will over our lives. And... When we forget God's will of desire, what He wants for us to be like, we live like atheists, recklessly pursuing our own passions. And number three, when we forget God's will of direction, we live like atheists, wasting away our fragile, transitory lives, Living life like it's just a fog here today and vanished, forgotten tomorrow when we forget God's will of direction. That's the atheist life. That's not Christianity. A Christian has a very different posture, a very different worldview. That's why James calls it evil. Because it is so contrary to the Christian life to live without any regard for the will of God over our life. So, a very simple exhortation for you this morning. Don't live this year like an atheist. Don't live this year like an atheist with this presumptuousness that we'll just carry on living the presumptuousness that we're in control of the detail of our lives, over the outputs of our lives, and neglecting God's will of decree, desire, and direction. Don't live like an atheist. It's stressful. It's painful. It's wasteful. Gone. Like a fog. There's another way to live. It's a way of life that answers 
the big question. The big question. You know these, these questions of life. James asks the biggest life question. I don't know if you notice it. Just like four words in the passage. One of the most important questions you could ask of life. He just casually puts it out there, verse 14. What is your life? What is your life? Like, what is your life? What is the substance of your life? See, the answer to that question, for those who don't live in the kingdom of God, who don't have this worldview of God reigning and looking for His direction and wanting to follow His desire and acknowledging His decree, for those outside of that who only have the material world, who can only live for and see and pursue the here and now, for them, the answer to what is your life, I'm like, my life, well, well, that's the places I go. It's the way I spend my time. It's the money that I make. Those are the three things James mentioned in answer to that question. What is, what is your life? Well, go there, spend a year, make a profit. Those aren't random. For those with the atheist worldview and Christians who live with that kind of worldview, that's the answer to the question. Like, that's all there is, really. Truly. I mean, we do this all the time when you meet somebody new, like at a party and trying to break the ice. What's the first thing you say? And like, hey, so where are you from? You know? And I mean, it's a great icebreaker question. Like I just heard this morning, like Ariel. So yeah, we knew we had the East Rand connection, but we have the South of Joburg connection too. It's so, like, you know, that, wow, that means a lot. She's already like up here because of the answer to the question, where are you from? Places. And then what do you ask people? What do you do? I.e., how much do you make? Like we're kind of trying to get a figure for where they stand on the ladder. And then maybe you'll go deeper. What are your hobbies? How you spend your time? Places, calm, wealth. That's what we ask people. And hey, those are great icebreakers, but that's not the sum of who we are. The sum of our existence is not the places that we go the hobbies or the ways we spend our time and the wealth that we accumulate. What is your life? If it's just those things, that's temporary. It vanishes. It's gone. You live here, well, then you live there. You have this job, then you don't have the job. And even wealth just disappears. Just go read James 5. Just like l literally scan your eyes down. It talks about how all the wealth accumulate, how it corrodes, it disappears. It's all fog. It's a mist. It's a vapor. It's just gone. I think for me, that's the hardest part of this passage, is the answer to the question, what is your life? And James says, a vapor. I'm going, huh, that's, that's not much. And you see, for the non-Christian, well, it's true. It's true. Because everything accumulated and everything you've done just vanishes. It turns out that the sum of your existence is, in fact, fairly worthless, if all it is, is places and things and wealth. Just, it is. But that's not true for the Christian. We have a purpose that transcends the here and now, that extends into eternity, a purpose of worshiping and glorifying God here and now, of increasing from glory to glory until we are in eternity with Him forever in the place that He purchased with His own blood. Your life doesn't vanish. It's not worthless. You're not a mist. You're not a smoke. Jesus did not die for clouds. This is the Christian view. It's just remarkably different. A value, a purpose that transcends all of these temporary things. But outside of that, don't have this Christian worldview, well then this is it. 
fragile, temporary, very close to worthless, and you have no control over it. So I just want to end by asking you this question. What is your life? And I mean really, if we had to examine the evidence of what's important and the evidence of your predominant worldview, is it somebody living under the will of God? Or is it perhaps a little more obvious that yeah, you're a true born-again follower of Jesus who loves Him, but we live fact like atheists. Let's not live like atheists in 2020. Let's pray. Our <coughs> oh, Father, we come before you and even now as we, as we prepare to worship you again, acknowledging your sovereign will over our lives, it's just it's so hard to put words to this except to come before you And pray, ask you by your grace, Heavenly Father, by your grace, Lord Jesus, would you captivate our hearts and our minds and steer them, steer them in in the direction of your kingdom. God, we acknowledge that we often live like atheists in our character in our standards of ethics and we come before you this morning and confess in the way we go about our planning with this presumptuousness the assumptions that we make that we're in control and we are not and we acknowledge that before you and we praise you jesus praise you knowing that you are in control and you're a good father you're a good king who watches over us and we know that even sometimes your will of decree is for us to go through difficulties to accomplish your will of desire to increase our faith and to transform our character and so we just humble ourselves before you worship you and praise you and say lead us God lead us we pray In Jesus Christ, our Lord's name, our Lord, our King, our Master, our Savior's name. Amen.